chapter, the very first one. So a quick outline. Uh, we'll start with a short bio of Mencius. Sorry about the misspelling here. Uh, and uh, then we'll go into actually some of the questions kind of Alex uh, brought up. Uh, Mencius, I call it Mencius versus the, the establishment. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the historical background and landscape at that time, what kind of challenges he was facing. Uh, he was actually kind of a, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you might say a dreamer, a radical, uh, and trying to subvert the establishment thinking at that time. And, um, and what happened afterward? Uh, uh, this, I pose a question, uh, borrowed by from Langston Hughes, what happens to a dream deferred? And this question will become a little more uh, obvious, hopefully, as I proceed. And then we're gonna do uh, two sections of uh, the, the chapter. I was more ambitious, I wanted to really cover the whole chapter, but as I translated things, um, uh, time, uh, I ran out of time, so I, I picked what I thought maybe the, the, the two more substantive, most uh, uh, interesting ones. And then we'll open for discussion. So, as I normally often do, I start with the venerable book of the uh, records of the Grand Historian, which was written only, I think, less than 200 years after Mencius. So um, this is not the complete uh, chapter. So uh, I, uh, I'm picking uh, the most uh, important sections about Mencius. So here, I'll read it. Munk, which is the actual name of Mencius, was a Zhou person. He learned from the school of Zisi, and Zisi was uh, Confucius' grandson. Upon understanding Dao, he journeyed to work for King Xuan of Qi. King Xuan could not use it. He went to Liang. King Hui of Liang did not permit his teaching to fruition, seeing it as pedantically remote and wide of practical matters. I think this might resonate with uh, Alex. At the time, the state of Qing employed Lord Shangyang. The result was the state amassed wealth and its military strengthened. Chu employed Wu Qi. And result, Wu Qi uh, Chu defeated and weakened its opponents. King Wei and King Xuan of Qi employed the likes of Sun Zi, Tian Ji, and other feudal kings prostrated eastward towards Qi. At the time when all under heaven were preoccupied with horizontal and vertical alliances, valuing invasions and attacks as worthy and just, Meng Ke instead was narrating the virtues of sage kings Tang, Yu, and the three dynasties. Therefore, of whom he visited, none joined. He retreated to work with such students as Wan Zhang to annotate the books of poems, book of records, narrate the meaning of Zhong Ni, was a Confucius, and authored seven chapters of Mengzi, his own book. When Duke Ling of Wei, so I'm skipping a whole bunch of stuff in the middle here and going jumping forward to the commentary by the grand historian. When Duke Ling of Wei asked about battle formation, Confucius did not respond. When King Hui of Liang planned to attack Zhao, Mencius praised instead how the ancient Grand King moved his state being to escape invasion by the D nation. So what, uh, the, the commentary here is that the kings were interested in military victory. But the Confucianists, like Confucius and Mencius, uh, Confucius refused to even talk about it. Mencius even went beyond. Instead of not talking about it, he started praising 
uh, ancient rulers who just uh, moved his uh, moved his state away to avoid uh, warfare. How can such ever be ones who aspire to pander to the to the mundane world, just seeking adopters, holding a square handle and try to insert it into a round pit? How could it be accepted? So this commentary here is saying. Basically, uh, Confucius and Mencius were the types that held on to their beliefs. I refused to pander to the to the masses or to the kings, and this is really uh, given the political landscape of the time. It was really like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. So, um, I, 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 so. Uh... Before Pin started, I I like to kind of like uh, uh, um, uh, talk about the uh, how well I I totally agree. Uh, Alex talk about is I naive, but after I read um, uh, the Prince from Machiavelli, okay, so it's a very good comparison. Now, uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 Machiavelli lived in the time, okay. Italy, it's just like a warring state in China. They have a different family, okay, uh, Bourgeois uh, and uh, uh, the Medici family. Okay, that's the here advice. Similar to Liang Hui Wang here, okay, the King Hui of Liang. He asked Mencius, okay, for advice. Same situation as Machiavelli, okay. The Machiavelli give advice to one of the prince who is the powerful one, potential uh, right about uh, Dimitri family, right? And you can see what what's different kind of advice they give. You can say, okay, Mencius is naive, it doesn't work. Okay, uh, 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 Machiavelli is evil, okay? But let's set this aside. Uh, the, the key point here is we can see how, what kind of different idea and uh, what kind of person, what kind of courage you have to bring up this idea. Even he probably know it's naive, but I think that's a, 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 a comparison we can look at, you know, uh, it, with the similar situation and two different advice give the two different uh, idea. Yeah. One is a technical, one is moral. I think that's the, the, the key. Thank you, Jason. So it was interesting actually when um, Alex used the, the word dream. Somehow that must have come into my mind too, because I was as I was preparing these slides, the famous poem by Langston Hughes, the great American writer Harlem, came into my mind for some reason. What happens to a dream deferred? And we'll come back to this poem later. So I put here the uh, the the uh, biography in Chinese for those who are interested. And uh, so let me start with a little bit of the situational uh, historical background at that time. So Mencius was in the Warring States period the very last stage of the Zhou dynasty when it was falling apart. And this is the time about 400 to 200 BC. At that time, seven states dominated China. And this is from a situation where 300 years before that, there were more than a hundred states. So as you can imagine, there was a lot of brutal hostile corporate merger and takeovers, if you will, or rather state mergers and takeovers. By that time, military campaigns with hundreds of thousands of soldiers on each side became common. Rulers were preoccupied with military, building up military strength, both for conquering and for self-preservation. Basically, Qing was the rising star uh, expanding very, very quickly in strength after their legalist reforms. Um, all the other states' rulers were shitting their pants. And uh, as we know, eventually Qin brought all the other states to their knees and unified China. 
So measures, sorry. I have to manage my screen because uh, all these other elements block part of the screen. <laughs> screen. So that's why I have these pauses. Yeah, uh, Alex has a hands up, so. Uh, okay, yeah, Alex, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, add a short uh, comment to the period of war and states. Um, it sounds like it's war and states, but this is also, uh, a, I just want to give other people some other background. This is also the time where, you know, technology and culture and you know literature and all sorts of theories on, on war and how to govern and and all these philosophers this is the time you know it, even though it was a very difficult time in the chinese history but it also produced a lot of very valuable uh, um things that for us to study later, especially on, on the technology, you've seen the terracotta uh, soldiers from the, 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 uh, uh, from the, the Qing Shi Huang's uh, tomb, but there are also many other inventions that time. So it's a period of very inventive period where everyone wants to try their best to, to make the best of everything and win each other as well as philosophy development. Thank you, Alex. That's exactly right. This is an age where um, generally considered the transition to Iron Age from Bronze Age in China. This is also the blossoming of the hundred schools of thought, really the golden period of ancient Chinese philosophy and thought. And uh, standard of living, we believe, was actually very high relative to the rest of the world, even though there was a lot of warfare. And so Mencius, where was he from? So he's from a tiny little state called Zhou, really the size of about a county. Uh, you can see Zhou was later taken over by the great state Chu. And you can see Zhou is very near, not far from Qi and not from, from Wei. And we talk about King Hui of Liang. Liang is actually just another name for Wei. So Wei and Liang are the same, same thing. Uh, Liang is the capital, named the capital of Wei. And so a lot of times it was just called Liang. Okay. And so kind of extending a little bit of what Alex uh, added, the, in the biography, uh, if you recall that we just read, he went, he first went to the state of Qi to try to convince the king of Qi to adopt his ideology. So there's a good reasons why he would do that. First of all, he wasn't very far from Qi. Another thing was Qi was very well known at that time, being very welcoming to all schools of thought. And the king created the Qi Xia Academy, which is one of the world's earliest state-sponsored institutions of intellectual higher learning. It was established by the king around uh, 350 BC. So prominent scholars from diverse schools of thought and, and states uh, went over there and they were uh, bestowed official titles and, and residences and uh, the government support for their livelihood. Um, at the time. So it was really a gathering space, a uh, gathering place for a lot of the top notch thinkers that we still know today. Had a thousand plus scholars, including Manchus, Xunzi, conducted re regular debates, wrote books, and uh, lectures. And Xunzi was particularly um, venerated at, at that time. He was. Uh, served as the chair or the president of the school. Who was uh, Shen Zhe again? I'm sorry? Who was Shen Zhe in terms of uh, the history of Chinese philosophy? Xin Zhe was another Confucianist uh, giant. And he kind of had a, a opposing philosophy of, of uh, Mencius, even though they're both Confucianists. 
Mencius uh, preached that pe humans were are born with the seed of benevolence and goodness. And Xinzi um, professed that people are born with bad qualities. And that's why you need to educate them to make them into good. So another thing to explain in the biography is this term uh, vertical alliance and horizontal alliance that the kings were preoccupied with that. So here again, we go back to the map of the warring states period. And Qin was the juggernaut, growing really rapidly in strength and constantly expanding and attacking the other six major states. So Qin is the big uh, pink uh, uh, state on the left here in the West. So, and this was really, um, Lord Songyang was kind of the first person to start reforming Qin, applying his legalist school philosophy and created a state that was at the same time more totalitarian and egalitarian than the other states, and therefore amassed highly centralized power, but drawing talent from directly from all layers of society. It used to be uh, the states in the feudalistic system at that time, only really nobility and their associates served in government, but Qin completely kind of decimated that, the hierarchy and anyone could enter into government and military service. So that made the nation very strong. And um, so in response to this great growing threat uh, for self-preservation, there were two strategies uh, by the other six states and they were competing strategies. One was to combine vertically. So that means forming an alliance of the six states to defend themselves against Qin. So this is called the vertical alliance because if you draw, group all these six states on the east together, it looks like a more of a vertical block. The other strategy was the opposite, was to screw the other states, build an alliance with Qin, to you want to be with a powerful nation that was going to defeat everyone anyway. So you might as well join the powerful one first, negotiate good terms, and hope that Qin will actually spare you and maybe even share some of the war loot with you. So that's about that's called the horizontal connection. And it's called horizontal because if you any of the states connect with Qin, you draw a line that's more of a horizontal line. Did this change uh, over time? The, yes, it uh, did. The, the horizontal and vertical? Yeah. So I'll get into a little bit of that uh, right here. So at that time, let's go through some of these uh, figures that the biography of the grand historian mentioned that were the, the power wielders of the day. The establishment that Mengzi was trying to go against. General and Minister Wu Qi. He was a major war philosopher, wrote his own book. Um, he was often uh, mentioned together in Chinese language with uh, Sun, Tzu, Sun Tzu. And at the same time, also a legalist philosopher. He, uh, when he served for Wei, also Liang, uh, AKA the Liang, he won many uh, decisive battles. And then he went to Chu and he implemented the legal political reform, a little bit similar to what happened in Qin, where he destroyed them, took away the privileges of the nobilities, and um, uh, drew everyone you know, uh, of all classes into, into government and applied law, law and order uh, evenly to everyone who's not the king. And uh, he actually raised the ires of the nobility so much that they, uh, they killed him. 
you had Prime Minister Song Yang of Qin, I already uh, talked about that. You had uh, Generals Sun Bing and Tian Ji, who uh, won uh, major battles, were very brilliant uh, strategies and tactical uh, uh, divisors. And Su Qin, who was kind of the inventor of the vertical alliance, he was extremely prominent. He at one time convinced the kings of all six states to enter into a vertical accord against Qin. So kind of a formula of a sort of a NATO-like alliance, if you will. And actually simultaneously appointed by all six states to be their prime minister. So for a short period of time, he really was the most prominent, most powerful person. And a little bit after him, in response to the vertical alliance, another person very similar to Su Qin uh, in character was Zhang Yi. Actually, he, he was more underhanded than Su Qin, to be fair. And uh, he was the main promoter of the horizontal alliance. And his main purpose was to destroy, dismantle the vertical alliance that was actually uh, effective at times in checking Qin. So he uh, did it through diplomacy, lies, and bribery. And actually, he managed to, to take apart, just completely dismantle the vertical alliance and play the key role in Qin's eventual conquer of all these other states. And where does uh, Mencius fit in? Well, his uh, lifetime was right about in between. So, so I listed these people kind of in chronological order. So Mencius is right around the time of Su Qin and Zhang Yi. So you see, these are the powerful uh, people that he was uh, fighting against, uh, praising virtue to kings. <laughs> and so Zhang Yi is a, quite a character get into him a little bit here, just to sort of show what, what, kind, of, what kind of people that, uh, that Mencius was uh, up against. So this is from, uh, mostly from Wikipedia. Zhang Yi was a native of the state of Wei, uh, the same as Liang. Zhang Yi studied under Gui Guzi and learned politics and foreign relationships. After Su Qin died, Zhang Yi left Gui Guzi and arrived at the state of Chu. He received a severe beating at a banquet in the house of a minister of Chu. When he was wrongly accused of stealing a gem, it is said that on his return home, he said to his wife, his wife was very worried, thought he was half dead. You know? And she said, no, there was only one thing I wanted you to check. He opened his mouth and said, said see if my tongue is still there. His wife laughed, checked, and declared that it was safe and sound. He excitedly called out, uh, called out, that is all I need. He then went to the state of Qing in 329 BC and saw Qing, Qing Huai of Qi, Hui of Qi, who had earlier rejected Su. Qing Hui accepted, accepted him as a high minister. And in 328 BC, he led a successful campaign against his native state, so his own state, he invaded, uh, by which Qing acquired a large part of Wei. He later bamboozled Chu, I added this part, Chu, into losing large tracts of territory. So this is the kind of people that were um, uh, winning the favors of kings, okay? So how about Mencius? He, uh, as I said, his lifetime was right around the time of Su Qin and Zhang. About 100, almost 180 years after Confucius. He is an active, academic descendant of Confucius's grandson. So he traces a uh, academic lineage all the way to Confucius. And uh, as we can tell from the biography of the grand historian, right? It was kind of a melancholy, uh, 
life where he traveled, he had uh, his, um, he thought he understand the Tao, the essence of the world and life. He went around trying to preach and um, get kings, powerful kings to adopt his ideology to make the world better. He never accomplished that. Everywhere he went, he was rejected. So eventually he went back and wrote uh, some books with his students. And annotated some books and wrote his own with his students. So, but 2,300 years later, you know, halfway across the world, we're sitting here talking about it. So there must be a triumphant moment, right? When did that happen? Well, you have to wait 1,300 years. For 1,300 years, he had been regarded as, in China, as just among, one among the myriad thinkers of Zhou Dynasty. So, you know, in today's language, he was considered a influencer, but, you know, maybe had hundreds of thousands of Twitter followers, but he was no, uh, no Kim Kardashian by any measures. <laughs> All right. And uh, so he did not receive any semblance of the reverence reserved for Confucius, or even Confucius' favorite student, Yang Hui. Yang Hui was actually, you know, inducted into Confucius' temple. Uh, Mencius was not there. So, but by Song Dynasty, which is about roughly a thousand years ago, uh, the court and the Neo-Confucianists, especially Zhu Xi, greatly elevated his stature. And uh, in AD uh, 1083, unfortunately, the court just bestowed the posthumous title of the Duke of Zhou, Duke of Zhou, sorry. And next year, he inducted him into the Confucius temple. And uh, basically, from that time on, he attained sagehood, you know, officially. Uh, his book became one of the four books that was, uh, you know, the must know if you wanted to uh, take the imperial civil exam and enter government service. And so today, 2,300 years after Mencius, what he professed constitutes really essential parts of Chinese thinking and social norm. It's embedded in us. And uh, this is, yeah, his influence today is incomparable by all these other people, his, these aforementioned contemporaries who at the time outshined him and wield a great power. So his day has come for sure. And uh, so in fact, it's interesting to me actually, you look at the Zhou dynasty philosophers that are most influential today, Laozi, Confucius, Zhuangzi, Mencius, Han Feizi, they tend to be from the most, come from the most humble ranks of society and really lacking in material accomplishment. You know, uh, Confucius were similar to Mengzi. What he set out to do, he never accomplished. Basically had nothing to show at the end of his life. But uh, today they're the most revered and influential. Uh, with Sunzi being a notable exception, he was actually a, a, a powerful general. I think Joe has uh, his hands up. Do you want? Oh, yeah, Joe. Yes, Pin. But isn't the reason that they are so revered because they never actually put their philosophies into practice? And therefore, that's the reason, like, oh, these guys were really great, but it was never done. Yeah, that's a possibility. That's an interesting, you know, interesting observation. So, but. Uh, in some ways they were done, but I'm not sure if it's done the way they envisioned. So I, I don't know, you know. Uh, uh, Alex, you have a quick comment? Yeah, I just want to ask you about the, the lot in the last slide, you said Mengzi was one of the four books um, yeah. to, to study. But I, I thought, I believe you, last time you mentioned that Mengzi actually didn't write any book. So I, I'm guessing that this book about, it's a book about Mengzi and what he preached. Someone else wrote it for him, wrote, wrote about Meng, Mengzi. Or did he write it himself? I... Oh, well, I don't remember saying that. 
but that's okay. I can uh, still answer the question. Uh, it's not clear whether Mons, how much of Mons he wrote himself. Maybe none, maybe some, but certainly it's written in the voice of his students. It's always like Mons said this, Mons said that, you know, in Zi at that time means teacher. So it's always was teacher Mun said this, teacher Mun said that. So it's certainly written in the voice. It's like the analects of Confucius, you know, Kun, Kunzi said this, Kunzi said that. It certainly sounds like uh, it was written by his students and his students' students. Uh, so I, you know, uh, my, my estimation is that uh, probably Monzi didn't directly write the book, although, I, you know, we, we'll, we can never know for sure. Yeah, so I anyway. would say they, 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 I think the same as the Confucius, right? They, <clears throat> I don't think they are writing any uh, the book, but Mencius' teacher, okay, Zi Si wrote the one of the four book, right? The, well, the, right, the, the great learning, probably compiled by him. Yeah. Is that right, uh, Pin? Do you agree? On I that? can't remember if uh, Zhong Yong, the, the way of the Ming or the great learning. Yeah, one of I think the great learning is, yeah. is written by uh, Mencius' teacher and the uh, Zheng Sen, uh, Confucius' youngest and uh, um, student, I think, right? Mm -hmm. and I think right. these two uh, wrote uh, the uh, great learning and then great, so you, if you read this chapter and then read the great learning, you will see a lot of same tone because it's written by uh, Mencius teacher. Okay, so I will introduce a great learning, you know, someday, you know, it's also very interesting. So yeah, now um, let's go back to this poem by Lang Sing Hu. What happens to a dream deferred? Uh, what are Langston Hughes' thoughts? Actually, would someone do me a favor? Uh, any volunteer to read this? Maybe Madeline would do it. Do you mean to read the poem? Uh, yes. Um, well, I'd like to. I don't have a call. I, I, have, I can do it in about 30 seconds, okay? I, I can read it, Pim. Okay, yeah, James, thank you. Okay. What, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? Thank you very much. So my answer will be Mencius's stream exploded. Only it happened 1400 years later. <laughs> so, so to all of us, don't despair. You know, triumph will eventually come, but sometimes you have to wait for more than a millennium. <laughs> Or you have to have a whole world, not just a China. <laughs> yes. So let's go into the reading of some of the original uh, text. So opening scene, I call it an old man radically challenges the establishment by saying that a ruler should forget profit and practice Zen and Yi. Mention so so uh, these translations I, I tweaked um, I tweaked them myself because uh, I, I find some of the stuff was is wrong <laughs> in my opinion. So okay, so Mention saw King Hui of Liang. The king said, "O oh, gentleman who has come undeterred by a thousand li of travel, so a li is about three hundred meters. Surely you have something that will profit my state." Mencius replied, why must your majesty speak of profit? I have only Zhen, which roughly uh, means humanity or compassion, and Yi, roughly meaning righteousness, to offer. When the king says, what would profit my state? Senior officials say, what would profit our clans? 
rank and file and commoners say, what will profit ourselves? Superiors and inferiors compete for profit, and the state is in danger. In the state of 10,000 shen, uh, often translated as chariots, one who murders the ruler shall be the head of a family of a thousand shen. In the state of a thousand shen, one who murders the ruler shall be the chief of a family of a hundred shen. Owning a thousand in 10,000 and a hundred in a thousand is nothing to be little, meaning that they have quite enough. But if righteousness is deferred and profit comes first, they will not be sated without resting from others. There never has been a person of Ren who leaves behind parents. There never has been a person of Yi who puts his ruler last. May your majesty too speak of only of Ren and Yi. What need, what need is there to speak of prophet? Uh, Joe, you have your hands up. You have a quick comment? Yeah, just um, a really brief comment. Is it that he, since he believed that people were inherently good, but that they needed to con uh, to uh, cultivate that goodness, um, that benevolence or wisdom, or that he uh, is it that he felt profit would pervert that that wisdom or that benevolence, and therefore pervert people, and the system itself would actually. Uh, you know, make them uh, to uh, instead of make them good, actually draw them away from nature and make them more selfish. Oh, I would say it's uh, excellent insight. Yes, I, I personally, I, I, I very much agree with you. Your your interpretation. So, a little bit. Of this term "shen" is an interesting thing. So, I wanted to spend a little time on that. So. No glossary, shen, often translated as chariots. I understood, uh, I, I believe probably 99% of the Chinese people misunderstand, don't understand its real meaning in, in this context, um, let alone people who don't read Chinese. So yes, it does have a meaning that's like chariots, but here in the context, it really means a lot more than that. Here is, uh, when it's used in this sense, and it's, uh, it's used a lot in the ancient texts, so I think we should understand this. Sheng is a measure of integrated state strength. Its origin is that uh, in Zhou Dynasty, a community of about half square miles is expected to contribute the following to the state. One heavy chariot, three armored officers, and 72 infantry soldiers. So a state of a thousand shen, at least theoretically, was able to mobilize a thousand heavy chariots, 3,000 armored soldiers, and 72,000 infantry troops when they waged war. So at that time, the few really major states like Chu and Qin were uh, often referred to as states of 10,000 Shen class. And the 1,000 Shen states were the kind of the medium, medium strength, you know, weaker states. All right, so uh, the, our next uh, segment of reading, I basically skipped through a lot of the stuff in, in between, uh, went to the, very, the last segment. So I'll break that down into a few different uh, segments. So the uh, first one I call... Uh, Pin, so you are going to move to, to <clears throat> the other story, the, to the end of story? Yeah, his dialogue with Qi Xuan Wang. Uh, the, the the, so, so right Wang now we go to the, the last very long part, you know, so we already done with the uh, Wei, right? The uh, uh, Hui. Yeah. King so, Hui. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So my main point there uh, for picking that uh, opening uh, section is, you know, it illustrates how, you know, how he was received, what the kings expected him to tell them, 
And then he starts talking about this, uh, you know, compassion and righteousness and everything. And so he really was uh, kind of out of tune, you know, uh, for that time. Uh, I think it took a lot of courage on his part to <laughs> go around. So, uh, so okay, uh, do, do you want to discuss a little bit the story or you want to uh, finish this one and discuss the... Uh, that's, that's funny. So, so yeah, let's just go through the material and then we'll hopefully we'll have plenty of time for, for this one. So this next section I called uh, From Compassion for an Ox to All Humanity. So this is when he went to the state of Qi. He saw the king there. So the king asked him, what kind of qualities are necessary for real kinship? I skipped over some parts. So basically kinship, this word I should explain a little bit. So in Zhou Dynasty, you have all this, these states. And originally, only one state, Zhou, which was the, the, the uh, nominally uh, ruled supreme state that ruled all of uh, China at that time. Uh, only that ruler could, could call himself king. All the other ones were of uh, various different uh, feudal ranks, like dukes, marquis, uh, things like that. So uh, here, kingship used almost kind of like a verb sometimes, meaning that someone who uh, could unite uh, all under heaven. And when Confucianists use this word, it has even a different meaning that someone who could just, justly, through proper means, unite, uh, unite all under heaven. So this is what, what uh, the theme here. So the king asked him, so what, you know, you brought up this concept, and I'm not familiar with it. So, so what, what does it take, first of all? So Mencia said, if you become a king by taking care of the people, no one can oppose you. So the king was low intrigued, said, is someone like me capable of taking care of the people? Mencia said, sure. And the king said, how do you know I can? We just met. So Mencia replied, I heard this story from your servant, Hu He He said that you were sitting up in the main hall and the man walked past the lower part leading an ox. You saw this and asked, what are you doing with the ox? He replied, we are going to consecrate a bell with its blood. You said, let it go. I don't have the heart to see a frightened in, uh, to, its, to see its frightened tremor, as though going to a place of death without crying. The man then answered, shall we forego the consecration of the bell? You said, how can it be forgone? It's sacred. Substitute it with a goat. Mencius then added, I don't know if this, this is a true story. The king said, indeed it is. Mencia said, if you possess this heart, you are capable of true kingship. The people all thought you were miserly, but I firmly know your sympathy. The king said, you are right. Yet the people really thought that I was being miserly, even though she is remote and small. How could I begrudge an ox? I simply didn't have the heart to see its frightened tremor as though going to a place of death without crime. That's why I replaced it for a goat. Mencia said, my king should not think it strange that people thought you were stingy. You changed a large man animal for a small one. So how could they know your real motivation? If you were really pained as it's innocently going to execution, what's the difference between an ox and a goat? The king laughed and said, truly, what was I thinking? But I didn't change it because of the expense. I, no wonder people have called me miserly. Mencia said, no harm. What you did was an act of ren. You saw the ox, but had not seen the goat. 
when it comes to animals, if Junzi, this is another uh, Confucianist jargon, uh, often translated as noble person, has seen them while uh, seeing animals while alive, they have not the heart to watch them die. If they hear their sound, they haven't the heart to eat their meat. Therefore, Junzi stays away from the kitchen. The king was pleased and said, it is said in the book of poems, people who have their minds, I fathom them, fathom them. Uh, this is, he's referring to that basically, um, Mencius uh, was able to uh, sympathize with his true thinking. What you have said is just exactly what happened with me. But when I saw it within myself, I couldn't really see my own motivations. As you have shown me, there is compassion in my heart. But how is this bef befitting for kinship? So Mencius elaborated. He said, suppose someone said this to you, I am strong enough to lift 600 kilos, but not strong enough to lift a feather. My eyesight is sharp enough to scrutinize the tip of autumn down, down, but I could not see a wagon load of firewood. Can you go along with this? No, the king said. Mencius said, then how is it that your compassion reaches to animals, but not down to the people? If the single feather is not lifted, it is because your strength is not applied. And when the wagon load of firewood is not seen, it is because your vision is not applied. The people's not experiencing your care is because your compassion is not applied. Therefore, your majesty's lack of true kinship is because of a lack of effort, not a lack of ability. The king asked, what is the difference between non-effort and inability? Mencius replied, if it's the case of taking Mount Tai under your arm and leaping over the North Sea and say, I am unable, then this is truly inability. This is true inability. If it is the case of snapping a branch off a tree for an elder and you say, I am unable, this is not effort. It is not an inability. Thus, your majesty is not achieving kingship is not in the category of taking Mount Tai under your arm and leaping over the North Sea. It falls in the category of not taking, not breaking a branch. Take care of your, of your own elders. Extend the same to others' elders. Foster your children. Extend the same to others' children. You will operate the kingdom in the palm of your hand. The book of poems says, the king's example affected his wife. It reached to his brother, brothers, such that he could manage his clan and his state. It simply speaks to applying such heart to others. Thus, extending compassion enables one to protect all within the four seas. That's uh, another experience ancient Chinese expression within the, all within the four seas, meaning basically the whole continent, all the land, or entire China. Not extending a compassion, one has nothing to keep wife and kids safe. The superior thing that ancient people had on us is none other than this. They were simply good at extending their deeds. Now your compassion is sufficient to reach animals, yet no effect reaching the people. Why is that? We first weigh, must weigh, then know the degree of light and heavy. We first measure, then know long and short. Matters are generally as such, and especially the heart. My king, please gauge. Is it that you must build up your your armaments, endanger your officials, and instigate resentment with other feudal rulers, and then you will satisfy, satisfy your heart? The king said, 
no, what joy do I have in such? I do as seeking my truly great desire. Mencius said, may I hear about my king's truly great desire? The king smiled and did not speak. So he was a little embarrassed to share. Mencius continued, is it that the rich and sweet delicacies are not enough for your mouth? Is your wardrobe of winter and summer clothes not enough for your body? Or do you not have enough vibrant visual pleasures to satisfy your eyes? Do you not have enough music for your ears listening? Or do you not have enough servants and concubines to serve before you? All your ministers can certainly supply these sufficiently to you. So how can you still want more of these? So this is a rhetorical question here. He knew this wasn't the answer. The king said, no, I don't want these. Then my king's great desire can be known, said Mencius. You want to expand your territory, make vassals of Qin and Chu, descend upon China and calm the four surrounding nations. Use uh, this, this uh, surrounding nations that refers to the, today we call the barbarians surrounding uh, the heartland of China. Using what you have been doing to get what you want, it's like climbing a tree to catch fish. So that's quite a statement. So we go into the next session, which I label, why should a king care? Okay, now he's getting to the point where The king said, no, um, uh, sorry. The king said, is it that bad? Mencia said, even worse. If you climb a tree to catch fish, even though you won't catch a fish, there will be no peril after. Doing what you have been doing in pursuit of what you want with all of your might, there surely will be peril. The king said, may I hear why? Mencia said, if there is a war between Zhou, so Zhou is the tiny little state that uh, Mencia is from, and Chu, Chu is one of the big, biggest states. Who does my king think will win? Chu will win. Indeed, a small state, so this is Mencia uh, saying, a small state is no match against a large state. A few is no match against many. The weak has no match against the wrong, uh, the, the strong. Within the four seas, there are nine regions of 1,000 square league, and he counts for one. If, one part, if with one part you try to subdue the other eight, how is this different from those fighting true? This is against fundamental. Now, if you initiate a government based on Yin, all the officials under heaven will want to stand in my king's court. All who tills will want to plow my king's fields. Merchants and traders will want to store their goods in your marketplaces. All the travelers will want to set out on your roads and all under heaven who wish their rulers to fall ill will come to cry on your shoulder. Who can defend against such a ruler? The king said, I am dull with it and unable to, come to progress to such goal on my own. Please support my aspiration. Instruct me with clarity. Even though I am not so sharp, please give it a try. So at this point, he kind of got the king in his hands. He uh, he's, seems to have come, convinced the king to get him on his side. So Mencius continued, said, I think we're going to only a shi. So a shi is a, another uh, hard to grasp concept. It's basically a class of people that's between nobility and commoners. Uh, they serve in the army, they serve in government. Uh, so only a shi is able to have a persistent heart without persistent asset. 
if people lack persistent assets, they cons consequently do not have persistent hearts. Lacking persistent heart, there is nothing they will not do in terms of uncontrolled deviance and extravagance. When the ruler trap people into crime and follow up with punishment, it is framing people. How could a then person be in power, frame people into crime and consider it just? So basically he's talking about, you know, you create a, a state where in which people don't have things like real estate, uh, persistent livelihood, and you're basically goading them, creating a situation where they go into crime. So it's really the state's fault. In, and when you punish them, it's unjust because you, you've already framed them into a life of crime. So what is his vision of implementation? I break into two parts. Uh, one is social justice, he, which he kind of alluded to. Oh, sorry. So this is where I, uh, when I cut and paste the things, it's a little mistake. So we already did the top part here. So he follows on with, therefore, the enlightened ruler will regulate the assets of people so that facing above, they have enough to serve their parents. And facing down, they can foster their wives and children. In good years, they always have enough to fill stomachs full, and in perilous years, they evade death. Then you goad them toward goodness, because it will be easy for them to follow suit. As it stands now, you regulate assets of people such that they look above and do not have enough to care for their parents. They look down and do not have enough to foster their wives and children. In good years, they suffer constantly. In perilous years, they cannot escape death. They don't have the wherewithal to even avoid death. What luxury do they have to cultivate the uh, right and ye, righteousness? Part two, I label the sustainable li livelihood. It's part of his vision. If you really want to execute the right way, then return to the fundamental. If mulberry trees are planted on homes of one acre, 50 year olds can wear silk. If you do not pull men away from, for, from their homes for battle to miss the breeding times of chicken, suckling pigs, dogs, and swine, 70 year olds can eat meat. On 20 acre fields, do not deprive people of their cultivation and harvesting times. A family of eight need not fear hunger. Carefully tend to education in local communities. Teach the meaning of filial piety and respect for elders. And the gray haired will not be seen in the streets carrying heavy burdens on their backs. There has never been a state where the elderly wore silk and ate meat and the people are neither hungry nor cold where kingship was not achieved. So here we conclude. I throw out some possible discussion topics, but we don't have to use them. Uh, these are just teasers. What do you think of Mencius's concept of extending compassion? Manchus spoke of the state framing people into crime by deprivation of livelihood. In the intervening sections that we skipped, Manchus discussed at length about crimes of the state and policies, saying that they're a tantamount to killing people with knives and leading beasts to eat humans. You have any thoughts about that? Um, what do you think of Manchus's model of sustainable communities. And uh, what do you think of Manchester's rhetorical effectiveness? So I am done talking. Thank you so much for staying with me with this very lengthy uh, presentation and let's, uh, let's discuss. Thank you.